Yeah, it's great to be uh, back at an in-person conference after a while. Uh, I've been at LastCon for probably four years now, and this is my second time talking, so it's really great to be here. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about API security today. Um, that's the topic of the day. Um, and just uh, an intro, um, I've been um, working in security for more than a decade. I started as a developer um, and made my way through developing uh, security products and went into application security designing um, defense for large organizations. And I have the privilege to lead a product security team uh, at Babylon today, advancing um, their mission um, to have an accessible healthcare in the hands of every person on earth. I'm really excited about it. Um, and I'm a, a defensive person at heart, a, a core defensive engineer. Um, I like to design for security problems. So, um, you know, if there is a hack or uh, if there is a vulnerability uh, that's out there, I'll be the first person in the room thinking about how to solve for it and prevent for it uh, in the future. So along the way, I filed multiple patterns on, on some of the uh, ideas I solved for, uh, you know, in, in security, in different security domains. Um, and I've had the opportunity to speak at um, conferences across the globe. Um, I uh, have spoken all across uh, the globe. And uh, last year, last time I was in South Korea speaking to an audience with the translator, which was really good. Uh, the audience were amazing. So I've had different experiences, and, and I really cherish it. Um, with that, I'll, I'll go to the agenda. Um, so I'll talk about. Um, how API and API security is different. Uh, you know, it, it, it's not something new, right? There, there have been APIs um, all the way along, uh, but I think uh, it's been, you know, becoming more and more distinct in the way how uh, we think of security um, in an API first world. So we'll talk about that. What are the key differences? How, what are the security implications? And then I'll talk about uh, the API threat landscape. Uh, as you all know, uh, it's all over the news today, API-related uh, vulnerabilities. So we'll just see a couple of them to uh, you know, set the stage. Um, and I'll talk about what I think would be a good protection strategy. Uh, it's really complex, so I want to take a high-level view, um, and I'll give you an overview of how I think about API uh, protection uh, in general. Um, so let's start with uh, the difference, right? So. If you look at the uh, topmost diagram, that's kind of the monolithic architecture where you have the traditional web app serving a web page. So if you think of, let's say, uh, a health uh, application, right? So the application is going to make a call for a health dashboard, and then the server will query the database and return back all the data in, in a HTML view, right? It's all in a single call. But if you look at uh, the current application, it's uh, you know, yeah. coined as PA, a you know, single page application. So they make a number of API calls to the backend. So if you want to pull up a health dashboard, it's going to probably uh, make a call to get uh, your height, uh, another call to get your weight, another call to get your pulse rate, and then it all sends uh, the data in the form of a JSON, a raw data, to the front end, and the front end has JavaScript to kind of put it together and give a nice view of it. Um, and it gives a lot of advantages. I mean, the UI is really cool, and you can do a lot of things uh, in the front end without, without having to call the back end, which is going to uh, save time, um, you know, improve user experience. Uh, and at the bottom, um, you see server-to-server -server calls, right? So you can, uh, instead of the client making a call, you can have another server, your partner, making a call to get that data. And they can use the data to display it in their app or process it uh, in the way they want. So uh, if I break it down, right, uh, and, and if you look at what's happening behind the scenes, uh, there are these. Uh, Elements, right? So if you look at the data queries, earlier it used to be a, a SQL query, probably, or a NoSQL query that's, that's fetching your data. And then uh, there is going to be HTML page that's returned. Um, and then the filtering happens at the database level. So if you want to fetch five uh, 
you know, profiles, you would say, you know, write a SQL query and you'll worry about SQL injection, how to, you know, protect against it. But today it's all uh, API. So if you want to uh, get file, file profiles, you can write a query param, you know, API to filter the data. And the, uh, and the processing happens on the server side. So instead of the SQL, uh, you know, processing the data, you'll have server process and return it. And, and um, you know, the data processing before the data is returned to the front end happens uh, on the uh, server side, right? So if you look at the traditional app, it will probably be a loop um, if you're doing object-oriented programming to take five profiles and return it. Um, for modern web apps, it's on the client side, right? So the clients control which profile you want to uh, display. I mean, the data is already there on the client side and the client can, you know, write a, a JavaScript and, you know, it can run a JavaScript to decide what to display. So the, the main point here is, I mean, the data source um, has shifted left. So if the source of data is, is, of course, it's stored in your database, but then how it's controlled in the way it is returned to the client um, it has shifted, right? It's, it's with the API, so it's running on the server logic. So what are the uh, security implications, right? So we talked about having a lot of different endpoints. So what does it mean from a security perspective, right? Uh, basically, you know, if you're a security engineer, you know, it, it really looks cool from a development standpoint, but if you look at it, it presents a wider attack surface, right? Instead of uh, having to secure one endpoint, having to worry about what is returned from that endpoint, you now, now have maybe 10 different endpoints for the same use case, right? Um, and things are broken down into microservices. So it's not just the endpoints, it can get integrated with different other microservices that can serve uh, multiple other use cases. So it's hard to nail down what use case this data is uh, being served for. Um, and we'll go into detail on what that is um, in the later slides, right? And then the data is object-based. Um, so any data you access is an object. Um, and indirect object reference is a more common vulnerability if you look at uh, APIs because risk uh, endpoints, the developers developing it want to make it work, want to present the data. But uh, you know, before presenting the data, we need to do a couple of checks, right? Before fetching an object from the database, we need to understand if the uh, client really needs that data and, and is authorized to fetch that data. Um, there could be cases where there are two clients, one uh, with access to that resource, another without access to that resource. So that needs to uh, be checked, which doesn't happen often. And then um, returning the data to the user is again, uh, based on the use case. So you don't want to return everything you get just as you get to the user. Um, so that's again uh, a, a big gap that, that goes unnoticed in, in some of the APIs. Um, the third part is filtering, right? Just like any uh, web application, you need to do security filtering, input validation, sanitization, make sure all the input and output are clean, um, going in and out. And it's just, uh, more to do with APIs because you have a lot of parameters. There are a lot of query parameters that come in that needs to be allowed. Um, and security filtering is hard. I mean, just in a web app, you know how uh, filtering happens. It's more like a Swiss cheese uh, kind of a model where things get, you know, allow listed of multiple uh, places, right? So, so yeah, these are high level security implication. And if you look at the threat landscape, it's very clear, right? Gartner predicted, uh, APIs to be the number one attack vector sometime back, and long back, we're almost in 2022, it's just two more months. And I think this is uh, being seen widely. I was reading x report like a couple of days back, um, and in that report, the, the cloud breaches um, are reported to be increased by 170%, and then almost two thirds of it is related to how APIs are being configured, how they are being deployed and run. So I think it's it's becoming more and more critical. Um, and OWASP released uh, an API top 10. Uh, how many of you know? Yeah, okay, good, awesome. Yeah, so this is really cool, I, I really like that project. Um, I just wanted to put it here to uh, kind of drive the point that there are similarities in the way that web app vulnerabilities and uh, you know the API vulnerabilities are seen, but there are also differences. If you look at the uh, bolded text, 
um, there are some key differences, right? Uh, for example, rate limiting becomes very important. You cannot have uh, people calling your API and getting your data for any number of time. Um, it, it's not just protected. And then um, some of the things like cross-site scripting is a little irrelevant uh, when it comes to APIs. It's not to say that you don't have to do sanitization or uh, you know input validation. It's just that you know it's not in one of the top tens, right? And if you look at uh, attacks like CSRF, like uh, cross-site re request forgery. Uh, that may not be applicable depending on how you set up your APIs. APIs uh, by design, they are stateless. If you're running an API and if it's a server-to-server -server call, um, you don't have any state, you, you don't probably have to worry about CSRF. Um, so yeah, so there are some key differences to note. Um, we'll look at the breaches in H121. These are not uh, something that I uh, personally did. I, I just wanted to showcase this as an example so we can you know, look at a live example of what happened to a company, right? Um, Facebook is great. I, I really like Facebook as a company. Um, earlier in the year, they had uh, 500 plus million profiles leak um, in their API. So what went wrong was they had an API. So the, the intention was good. Uh, the API, uh, allowed you as a an user to search for your friends with um, your friend's contact uh, number, phone number, right? So basically a good use case, well-intentioned use case. Um, but what was wrong was, you know, it, it allowed you to submit any number of uh, phone numbers. I mean, there, there was no rate limiting. You can just enumerate and, you know, just do a brute force guesswork on um, you know, whoever you want to find, basically. And and the scary part was it returned too much data, right? It just did not give you the name of that person so that you can connect and learn more. It gave you pretty much their email address, phone number, and um, their, their physical address to it, I think. So it, it was a lot of information that was unnecessary that was returned. And I think even though this was well-intentioned, uh, if I relate it to uh, some of the OWASP prop 10 attack, it, it kind of didn't have uh, the object level authorization. Um, so when a call is made, you have to check whether the resource that is accessed um, is uh, you know privileged to access that resource. That check not happened, and there was excessive data exposure. Of course, it, it returned a lot of data that it didn't have to, and then, Rate limiting was, you know, completely lacking. Right, you wouldn't expect someone to just keep bunching in a number, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of phone numbers to get the data out of uh, the server. So how to fix it? I think going back to the attack map, fix the authorization. Um, any call that comes in, um, not just uh, you know authenticate the call, but authorize the traffic and and see if the resource can be accessed. Um, and then define rate limits. I think this is the trickiest aspect, right? Um, if your business case uh, is to allow um, access for one record for, um, let's say, 24 hours, that needs to be defined, but it's not well thought out or defined in a lot of cases because it is, uh, it, it is kind of tricky to define it. You don't know how many uh, calls you will get in the first place. Um, so it's probably easier to monitor for anomalies understand what the behavior is for an API and then baseline it based on that. Um, and then define the data to be returned. Um, again, a very critical uh, point that ties back to the use case. If your use case is to serve a uh, name, just serve that, right? You don't have to send everything to the client and believe that the client will filter it for you because there are going to be attackers who can attack you from a different vector and get that data. Uh, and implement monitoring. I think that's, that's going to be across the board. Um, a second example, uh, Just Style, again, a, a great company. It's uh, a company in India, um, which is uh, a local uh, search company. It, it exposed 100 million um, users' personal data, right? So what happened was in 2019, uh, Just Style had a, a production database and a staging server. Um, and they did this, uh, you know, they did the connection between the production database and the staging server so that they could test a few things and run a few tests. But they accidentally exposed the staging server outside. 
Um, there was no uh, inventory of what the APIs in that staging were. Um, there was no cataloging of why it need to be connected, why it need to be exposed to the internet. Um, and it, it was just left as is, right? After the testing is done, people just uh, ignored it. And uh, a clever security researcher found the way in and he was able to access all the user's data Again, along with uh, email, phone number, gender, date of birth, a lot of uh, sensitive data. Um, so going back to the attack map, again, you know, this relates to improper assets management. So you need to manage your assets, just like your web assets. You need to categorize, catalog, you know, what APIs you are exposing, what are the sensitive APIs, what are your non-sensitive APIs, what are on the internet and what are not on the internet, and, and have a clear control on that. and then. Anything that's exposed uh, should have authentication, right? That's that's the baseline. So broken user authentication. Um, I, I think we, we talked about some of the fix. Uh, one thing to highlight would be to, uh, you know, keep an eye on shadow APIs, right? So if you have an API um, that's no longer in use or, you know, that has a, a newer version of it, uh, it needs to be closely monitored and deprecated. Uh, we don't have to have loopholes that allow attackers to come in and take the data and implement strong authorization and uh, you know authentication. Uh, that's that's key across all the microservices. So that I'll, I'll swiftly go into the protection strategy. Um, and when we talk about protection strategy, I want to start with the classification because we need to know what we are building the protection for. Um, it, it's, it's not uh, you know, set in stone, but the way I look at um, the APIs, it could be classified in, in a couple of different ways. So there are internal APIs, there are business to business external API, basically the APIs that allow your partner to connect to you and, and get data and use it the way they want. Um, and then there is business to consumer external API, um, these are APIs that are front, you know, back end to your mobile app or web app that allows your customers and consumers to connect and consume the data. Um, and then there are third party APIs. Um, and third party APIs are APIs that get consumed. So you have an API that consumes a third party API. And then there are APIs that could come in from merger and acquisition, um, which could be hosted somewhere else, right? So if I look at it from a security perspective, clearly uh, there is a box where some APIs are internet facing, which are gonna be uh, more uh, attack prone and some are internally facing. And then uh, the data sensitivity could vary. You can have APIs that are internal with uh, you know, sensitive PII, PHI data. Uh, there could be external APIs without any sensitivity or with sensitive data. So you can classify that accordingly. I think that runs across the board as a horizontal. Um, so, so it's good, we, we have a box, right? But if you look at uh, things in a real world, it, it doesn't really work in, in a particular box. For example, uh, you know, I've seen this across organizations where um, developers develop APIs and it's usually homegrown to solve for a particular use case. Um, so they look at a use case, they want to um, have it automated, they develop an API so that it makes their life easier. And then what happens is after six months or within a period of six months, the word gets spread within the company through your uh, all hands or showcase and developers like to showcase their APIs and then the other developer uh, is like, hey, this is really cool. I, I have a similar use case. Can I just plug in your API and, and use it, right? Which, which seems um, re really uh, nice and, and developers are always happy that their product is getting used. Um, so they enable it, right? And then after a few months, um, you know, there, there is a customer, there is a product manager who sees a customer with the same use case. And then he's like, uh, can I use this? Can we test this with our partners? And then again, I think, you know, the management and developers are very happy to enable a quick POC to, to that uh, API and get that tested. 
And then before you know, they they really, you know, like the product uh, and they want to make it commercial, right? And this is where usually I or, you know, the security professionals get involved. Um, they have a need to commercialize this API. They come and ask, hey, uh, Ravi, uh, is this good? Are we good to go? We need to go live tomorrow, right? Uh, that that puts me and everyone in an odd situation, right? Uh, so, I, and when I look at it, I, I find problems, right? And I immediately see a lot of vulnerabilities. And my problem with that is it has been there all the way since the API was developed. Um, and, and it drives me crazy. And you can imagine how that uh, discussion goes between uh, the teams, right? But I think there should be a better way to um, have things more consumable. Um, in, in the fast paced world, we need to embrace automation and velocity. So I think, uh, not to ignore the boxes, but I think as a building block, we can talk about a few controls, right? Any API that is developed, um, I think these are some of the key security capabilities that the APIs will need. Um, so you'll need an authentication, like we've talked about, it can be mutual TLS uh, or a HMAC token-based authentication, and it definitely needs to have authorization, so have well-defined object-based access policies. Um, and then uh, API key lifecycle management. So if you're having mutual TLS, you need to rotate the keys. Um, if you have HMAC-based keys, again, it needs to be revoked, replaced, rotated um, in a period of time. Um, and then rate limiting should be well thought out um, from the initial design, even from, from when you have use case defined. I think it's important to put your brains on how it can be abused and come up with rate limits um, that you can apply. Um, and then transport layer confidentiality and payload encryption goes kind of hand in hand. If you have sensitive data, you need uh, you know, payload encryption. You probably need payload encryption because transport layer confidentiality can uh, help you to a point. If you have a, a CDN that's going to uh, do your TLS decryption, uh, your data gets exposed, right? Uh, so you need to have end-to-end -end payload encryption for very critical uh, and sensitive data. Um, and then secrets management and data at rest protection, I, I think it's stable stakes. Uh, you, you need to have it across the board if you're developing API or web app or whatnot. Um, you can store uh, the secrets in a, in a secure vault, protect your data at rest with uh, secure key management practices. Um, and then automated bot detection um, is, again, very important control. I think that there needs to be monitoring uh, that's across the APIs uh, to monitor for your use cases, baseline the behavioral aspects of your use cases and detect anomalies, because you could be good at you know defining rate limits, but the practicality is you may not be able to define it in a way that's more restrictive or conservative. Uh, so you need to have a more inline detective tool that can analyze the behavior and alert you for anomalies that you can look for um, and detect for breaches. Um, content inspection and validation. Um, this goes back to the security uh, filtering point. You need to have a clear uh, inspection point where you can take the uh, data, inspect, sanitize if you need to before accepting it. And then logging, I think, is pretty standard. File upload protection is important. I, I talked a couple of years ago in last con on why it is important, especially in the um, era of APIs, because things are automated. If you look at uh, malware, malware are becoming uh, more fileless. So it's easy to automate and you know just um, uh, send a, a malware into your environment through your APIs, right? So it's it can impact you in any number of ways. So that needs to be guarded. Um, and then the last point is really perform um, value-driven threat modeling. I think this this uh, term was coined by Avi, who, who uh, came up, or maybe came up with this approach. Um, you know, the idea is if you have an API, it's not enough to find that you have an excesses. Uh, you have to think about what it really means, right? So if you have an XSS, maybe it's a stored XSS that goes into your database, allows you to add a user and 
do a cash transfer, right? So that type of thinking needs to uh, happen uh, when you're defining the, um, you know, the sprints, when you're defining the use cases, the abuse cases need to be thought of. And I'll um, quickly, you know, shift, shift to this slide and then I'll talk more about what questions we should ask um, in that area, right? So it, it's good to um, break and implement these building blocks, uh, but I think when it comes to risk-based uh, controls, you would need to optimize it um, across the board, across the circle. So you, you need to discover the APIs, catalog and identify the sensitive ones. And depending on which ones are sensitive, you would have a strategy to secure them from a security testing and security review process. Um, you don't have to really threat model all your internal APIs. For example, if they don't have sensitive data, they're not going to be exposed to anyone. Um, that's going to be very time consuming and maybe not uh, valuable. Um, so just focus on the ones that you need to secure based on the sensitivity. Uh, have test cases to find API related attacks. Like I said, you know, don't just look for uh, excesses, run a bug to find, uh, you know, uh, basic attacks, right? So look for API attacks and also apply policies. There are security policies that can be applied at uh, web application firewall level to rate limit or at your API gateway level. Um, so you need to apply the right policies for the right uh, set of APIs. Otherwise, um, I think it's, it's an open gate. Uh, and then have a clear uh, monitoring path to detect anomalies. I think we, we touched on this point a number of times. So yeah, with that, I'll go to some closing thoughts. Um, again, these related, relate to the value-based threat model that I talked about. Um, whenever the API is designed, I think security needs to be thought out uh, from the initial phase. Um, so if you're designing an API to, uh, let's say, enable cache transfer, um, you need to think about what's the po worst possible thing that can happen. Is it an XSS? If it's a stored XSS, can somebody, um, you know, get into the system and transfer the cache? Uh, and I think document the abuse cases um, upfront and, and try to tackle it. Um, and then the second part is about the data. Uh, it, this relates to the excessive uh, data exposure aspect. A anytime you develop an API, you need to think about what data the API is exposing to the outside world. Um, and what what will happen if hackers get it, if our competitors get it, what, what advantage that it gives to them, right? Um, it can be a well-intentioned API, but if it's just exposing too much data, it's, it's a big um, security risk. Um, and, and then you need to think about whether it is uh, appropriate and whether it is necessary to collect this data. Um, and then number two would be whether it's important to expose this data to the API call, right? I think. Um, like we saw in the Facebook example, uh, it's important to clearly define what data to be uh, exposed to what API calls. Um, otherwise, we are going to expose a lot of data that's not um, needed or, or probably that goes into um, hands of uh, hackers. Um, the third would be who are our API consumers? And that's a difficult question. Um, so your API consumer today could be an internal API, but tomorrow, like, like we discussed, it could be easily an external partner. So at any point in time of your API journey, clearly defining that consumer is very important. You need to know who you are exposing this data. And if that's changing, that's going to change um, you know, all our modeling to our previous questions, right? Do we need to expose this data? Um, do we need to collect this data and whatnot? Um, and then the security testing strategies, uh, I, I think um, the, these are good for traditional application as is today, but you know you need to have a testing strategy that suits your API, right? So the uh, penetration test and, and some of the other tests need to be defined so that you test specifically your API and see if it breaks or if it maps to some of the attacks in the OWASP API top 10. Uh, and the last one, um, of course, monitoring for anomalies. I think we, we touched up on this uh, aspect a lot of times. 
Um, I think these are common ground. Um, there could be multiple other questions that you may want to um, you know, run on APIs, but I think the important point here is um, you need to define this as you are developing um, your API, right? As you're coming up with this use case, as you're bringing the use case from uh, your product backlog into your sprint, that's when you need to think about it, not when you are exposing this to your partner. Um, so I think with that, I'll maybe just give a big, quick plug. We are hiring. So if you're excited, just contact me. I posted the job uh, in the job board. I think Babylon is an amazing company. Uh, that I, I thank you for your patience. <laughs>